Hi, boys and girls. Mrs. Dresba here from Logan Elementary to share another read aloud with you. Um, we've been working with historical fiction. So the story that we're gonna read today is another historical fiction that took place during the same time period as Number the Stars. And in the past, I know we've talked about making connections between books. So hopefully as we are reading this book today together, you're making connections not only to Number the Stars, but also to all of the other books that you have been reading during this unit as well. Also, it doesn't have to be books that we've read only during the unit. There's actually a part of this book that I think that you will be able to connect to our poetry unit a little bit as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The book is called The Wren and the Sparrow by Patrick Lewis. In a dark time, the old man lived in shadows, a weaver of carpets. He spent his days at a loom and his nights singing to a hurdy-gurdy, the only thing he owned. He sang so beautifully that it must have amused the stars. They twinkled so. His neighbors called him the Wren. The Wren had one beloved student, a young girl known only as the Sparrow. The town, a little hamlet in the center of Poland, hung on the edge of despair, not far from the tyrant and his guards. Magpies gasped and crows caw cautioned at what they saw from the sky. No bird nested in a land without trees. The trees had all been cut down for kindling. Food and clothing were strictly rationed. Stores that once provided necessities were boarded up. Voices of protest, long silenced, were but a memory. The town shriveled up like a rose without rain. Once, many years ago, music could be heard in the streets at all hours, but the gift of music soon dwindled to a sigh. On a day that shamed the sky, people were herded into the center of the town and forced to hand over their musical instruments, wooden or metal, it made no difference to the tyrant's guards who carelessly pitched them into wagons. A six-year-old's only possession, ten finger symbols tinkled like the sound of spring escaping winter. The guards held the boy upside down and shook him until the symbols fell from his hands. The marketplace groaned when a battered, bag, battered pipe organ was wheeled in a cart to the graveyard of musical instruments. The heart of the town's symphony stopped beating. Then, from two blocks away, a melody arrived in a velvet coach. It's the wren, someone whispered. He must be crazy in the head. The wren would never give up his hurdy-gurdy. But there he was in his wooden shoes, tattered black suit and woolen cap. He nodded to the sparrow and shook with fear for what he was about to do. Your rattle box, the guard demanded, hand it over. Allow an old man one last song, said the wren. Only the few who stood next to him could hear him murmur so that no one will ever forget this day. Without waiting for an answer, he began to play, slowly, softly at first. The crowd hummed, then joined in the singing. Before long, the marketplace, the entire town, seemed to shake with song. It is our grief, it is our pain, it is our fate. We don't complain. Our hopeless days give way to nights whose wounded stars have dimmed their lights. The words pierced the Polish sky, releasing the rain. Look, Sparrow, look, shouted the old man. Even the clouds are weeping. And the song of the singers, one people, one voice, rose and sank and rose again against the will of the evil tyrant. The guard ripped the stringed organ from the old man's hands, but he would not stop singing. As the wren was being dragged away, he sang louder and louder, his last song on earth. Then he was gone. The day sealed itself into the lockbox of memory. Later that night, the musical instruments were piled high next to the old button factory. They would be taken outside the barbed wire the next day and destroyed. Ducking under the window lights, the sparrow sneaked up to one of the wagons, found what she was looking for, and made off with it in the darkness. Somehow, she felt the wren watching over her. During the long nightmare, people buried their most precious belongings, like the last little pieces of themselves, in basements, attics, and walls. The sparrow tucked the hurdy-gurdy behind a boiler in the basement of her apartment building, where it lay undiscovered. 
And so it was that she kept the Wren's legacy alive. Three years later, when the tyranny became too much for the world to bear, the tyrant was overthrown and his ruthlessness died with him. One day, a small boy, one of the few children to survive, was scavenging for scraps of food when he found the hurdy-gurdy behind the basement boiler. He shouted to his friends to come quickly, and as they poked at it and strummed its strings, a piece of butcher paper slipped out from under the cracked soundboard. The boy thrilled to the message as if it were a note in a bottle floating at sea. My dear Sparrow, you have found the music box that was my heart. Now it belongs to you. Never stop singing. Your songs are the radio of heaven. Finder, if you are not the sparrow, know that once a young girl risked her life for an old man who lived in the key of despair, but the octave of truth, the wren. P.S. I beg you to keep this instrument from harm, a precious token from a dark time. The boy did just that. The hurdy-gurdy, safe from the ax and the flame, went with him everywhere, from Poland, to France, and finally to America. The music box began to show signs of age. Through the years, so did the boy, who grew into an old man. The old man I am now. Soon I will keep the promise I made to the wren I never knew, and hide a note in the sparrow's music box for my great-grandchildren to find, so that no one will ever forget. And there's actually a little afterword here too that I'm also going to read. There's an actual photograph um, of a little, it says a Jewish boy playing a violin in the Warsaw Ghetto, in Poland, February 1941. And I'm going to read this little afterword section over here and give us a little bit of history as to what the story is based on. This story is a work of imagination inspired by events in the Lodz Ghetto. In the city of Lodz, as in Jewish communities throughout Europe, the Jews were singled out, rounded up, and packed into a fenced quarter of Lodz, which became known as the Lodz Ghetto. Once confined to the ghetto, the fate of most Jews was sealed, the beginning of a journey from which there was no return. In 1940, the Lodz Ghetto held 230,000 people. It was the second largest Jewish community in Europe after Warsaw. Six years later, in 1945, when the Soviet army liberated the city, Fewer than 1,000 of Lodz's Jewish community had survived the horrors inflicted by the Nazis. Music was part of the landscape of ghettos and concentration camps. One popular street performer in the Lodz ghetto was, Yankee, was Yankily Hershkowitz. Survivors recorded his songs after the war. He was among the singers, including children, who sang in the streets for an audience hungry not only for food, but also for freedom of expression. For many victims of Nazi brutality, music was an important part of preserving and asserting their humanity. Music offered the Jews a way to express their humanity in inhuman conditions, a way to escape from reality and to give voice to their yearning for freedom, comfort, and hope. All right, boys and girls, I hope that you enjoyed that story. And today is a free write. So in your journals or on a piece of paper, whatever you've been doing your work on or in, Go ahead and take a few minutes and just jot down some thoughts. You know, maybe if you want to talk about what you thought about the story, or if you want to talk about how it connects to another story that you've read, or if you have some questions, maybe jot down some questions that maybe you could do a little bit of further research and have them answered. All right. Thanks for listening, boys and girls. We'll see you next week. Bye.